Yeah. Our first speaker is John Sellers, and I will introduce him very briefly. Uh, John Sellers is a reader in philosophy at Royal Holloway at University of London, a visiting research fellow at King's College of London, and a member of Common Room at Wolfson College in Oxford. He's also a member of two nonprofit uh, organizations aimed at bringing the ancient philosophy of Stoicism to a wider audience, namely Modern Stoicism and the Ireland Foundation. And he's currently chair of Modern Stoicism. He's the author of many books, and I'm only mentioning the first one, The Art of Reading the Stoics on the Nature and Function of Philosophy, which has already two or even three editions, maybe. It was originally published in 2003, and now I will mention the last ones, uh, The Fourfold Remedy in 2021. Barlow or Seminar on Stoic Ethics in 2022, and Aristotle Understanding the World's Greatest Philosopher, uh, published uh, this year. He's currently using the notion of philosophy as a way of life as a framework to reassess the philosophy of the Renaissance. Recent publications on this include Renaissance Humanism and Philosophy as a Way of Life, published in Metaphilosophy 2020. And Renaissance Consolations Philosophical Remedies for Faith and Fortune, published in an uh, edited volume in 2021 with Will. So, without further ado, I will give the word to John Sellers. Thank you so much for coming here. So, I think your second, third time in Hinduism. We are always very happy to have you here. Uh, the title of this talk today is On the Idea of Spiritual Exercise. Okay, so thank you, Marta, so much for all the hard work that went into organising it over a number of years. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about the idea of spiritual exercises. Um, what I'm going to present is the third version of this paper. The first version I read in Paris in May, the second version I read in London in June, and now the third version gets its outing here uh, in July. Um, both of the previous two versions had a slightly different title to this one. The title for those versions was Why Spiritual Exercises Are Not Spiritual. Um, but I've toned it down a bit for this third version, um, in part because my conclusion uh, has shifted a bit. Um, in fact, all three versions of this paper have had different conclusions, um, <laughs> which in itself tells you that my thoughts here are still fairly fluid. Uh, so I am genuinely interested in your comments, right? Because I don't think I've really finally decided um, where this is going. Um, and the other thing I should say is that the previous two versions of this paper were much shorter than the current one. So you're all getting brand new material that no one else heard before. <laughs> Um, so, as we know, Pierre Hadot's account of philosophy's way of life has recently been used in a variety of ways as a useful lens through which figures in the history of philosophy might be reassessed, or a framework for thinking about cross-cultural comparative philosophy with Indian and Chinese philosophy, and also as a fresh approach for thinking about philosophical pedagogy, amongst other things. And um, as we all know, there are now multiple books that have this phrase, philosophy as a way of life, as their title. However, despite this increase in interest, a number of reservations have also been expressed about what's perhaps the key concept in Hadot's account of philosophy as a way of life, namely the notion of spiritual exercise. And so what I want to do is revisit this notion of spiritual exercise and see if it's one worth keeping. So what are spiritual exercises? Um, Hado defines them as practices aimed at transforming our way of being. They are, he says, voluntary personal practices meant to bring about a transformation of the individual, a transformation of the self. These can include therapeutic techniques aimed at altering our emotions, a meditative focus on the present moment, self-dialogue, reflecting on death, to name just a few. But Hado is equally insistent that the theoretical exposition of philosophical ideas can also be considered a spiritual exercise. 
so long as it has this transformative effect. The same goes for poetry, art, and literature, all of which can transform how we see and interact with the world, he says. Now, the phrase spiritual exercise is often associated with the 16th century Jesuit, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, who wrote a book with this as its title. And in that book, Ignatius gave examples such as examination of one's conscience, meditation, contemplation, and prayer. Now, had those claimed that ancient philosophy involved these sorts of exercises, indeed, that ancient philosophy itself was thought of as a spiritual exercise, he says sometimes, has not, if claim has not gone without criticism. And the most important challenge, I think, is the charge that it anachronistically imposes a later Christian concept onto ancient pagan philosophy. So in his book, Pursuits of Wisdom, John Cooper argues that although we do see spiritual exercises in the philosophy of late antiquity, so the second and third centuries AD and onwards, this was the product of a contamination of a pagan philosophical tradition with an idea that had its origin in Christian religion. Hooper claims that the earliest example of a spiritual exercise that had sites comes from Seneca, writing in the first century AD. And Cooper argues that the very novelty of Seneca's practice of evening self-examination, recounted in his book De Ira on anger, um, counts against it being a common practice in the Hellenistic philosophical schools. This is kind of an anomalous activity that Seneca is describing, Cooper claims. What he doesn't note, however, is that same idea can be found in a short text known as the Pythagorean Golden Verses, which, although probably not dating back to Pythagoras himself, has certainly been shown to date from the very beginning of the Hellenistic period because it's cited by Cleanthes and Chrysippus in some of the fragments we have of theirs. Hooper also notes that the phrase spiritual exercise, I quote, seems to derive from Ignatius of Loyola's 16th century handbook. And as we've noted, Ignatius describes spiritual exercises as ways of examining one's conscious, meditating, contemplating, and praying. They are, Ignatius says, exercises for the soul, just as walking and running are exercises for the body. Now, Cooper notes that Haddo's own view was that Ignatius' exercises were nothing but a Christian version of a Greco-Roman tradition. This is the claim that Cooper wants to challenge. He says that almost all of Haddo's examples of spiritual exercises in ancient philosophy come from late sources, presumably after Christianity has infected the pagan philosophical tradition with this Christian concept. There are no examples, Cooper says, in the Hellenistic period from the third to first centuries. But the fact that Haddo doesn't point to any examples from, say, Stoics earlier than Seneca, perhaps ought not to come as much surprise given that the works of the Stoics from this period are largely lost. Ironically, the one Stoic text that survives is Cleanthes, decidedly spiritual, hymn to Zeus. Um, and Cooper himself acknowledges Epicurus, although he calls him a special case. So Seneca is the exception, and Epicurus is also the exception. Um, and then it looks like it falls apart a bit. Well, one example of Cooper's concern, he puts like this. He says, a great many of the alleged spiritual exercises had instances in his discussion of Hellenistic philosophy are no more than perfectly ordinary ways of getting oneself to understand the real meaning and implications of philosophical arguments and philosophical positions, to fix them in one's mind and to make oneself ready to apply them smoothly to situations of life as they may arise. These are parts of the intellectual training required to live philosophically. There's nothing at all spiritual in Hadot's sense of the term about them. Now, one might naturally wonder what Hadot's sense of the term spiritual was. Indeed, 
one might wonder in general what the meaning of the term spiritual might be. I personally have no idea at all what it means when someone says, I'm a very spiritual person. <laughs> I can go down the etymological route and say that something spiritual is presumably concerned with spirit, but I'm not sure I really know what spirit means either. I know it comes from the Latin spiritus, which seems to be as vague as its English equivalent. So is Cooper right to suggest that the term spiritual has unhelpful and distracting connotations? Or in my case, it's perhaps so vague, it has no connotations at all, and so isn't doing much work. Now, Cooper's not the only person to express reservations here. Some years earlier, Jonathan Barnes commented on Haddo's claim that spiritual exercises involve a radical change of being, adding that he thought that this idea was just too deep for him to understand. He continued by saying, the notion of intellectual scarces, of mental gymnastics, is at bottom a pretty down-to-earth sort of thing. After all, the idea of training or practice is hardly esoteric or religious or even remarkable. It's a piece of ordinary, robust common sense. So, the concern of both Cooper and Barnes is that the phrase spiritual exercise imply something religious, vague, and esoteric, when in fact, much of what, is intent, what it is intended to refer to is fairly straightforward and mundane. And I'm not unsympathetic to that thought, given that I have no idea what the word spiritual really means. But Cooper also charges Haddo with anachronistically taking this Christian concept and imposing it on pagan philosophy. And he's also charged with taking examples from late ancient philosophy that have become infected with this Christian idea and using them to make generalizations about ancient pagan philosophy as a whole. And these are the two charges that I want to respond to. Let me begin with this second charge first before coming back to think more about what the word spiritual might mean. So, as we've seen, Cooper comments that Haddo seems to have taken this concept of spiritual exercise from Ignatius. Many others have made a similar claim, including I myself, including I myself in a book chapter published just a couple of months ago, although in my defence I wrote it about eight years ago, <laughs> but that's the world of Oxford handbooks, they take a while to come out. In fact, Haddo does not take this notion directly from Ignatius, right? So everything that follows is a piece of self-refutation. Don't read any of my previously published works. Instead, Haddo tells us that he took it from two far more recent sources. Haddo's famous article on spiritual exercises opens with a quotation from the philosopher and sociologist George Friedman. In particular, his book on power and wisdom, published in 1970. Friedman has spent much of his career as a sociologist examining modern technological society and its impact on humans. His work has been described as an intense meditation on, techni um, on technical civilization. Concerned about the alienating effects of modern technology, Friedman called for a spiritual revolution that would put human values back center stage. Friedman's brief remarks about spiritual exercises deriving from notebook entries written during the war in 1942, um, on the run from the Gestapo, like all good French, French intellectuals, um, they appear immediately after a brief discussion of the philosophy of Spinoza. It's within this context that Friedman contemplates the idea of a purely human spiritual development, which he directly contrasts with otherworldly Christian spirituality. Friedman's idea is thus humanistic, in part prompted by his reading of Spinoza. Indeed, Friedman was explicitly looking for an alternative to the 
it, to establish religions, which he felt were unable to rise to the challenges facing modern society. Now, Hadot quite explicitly cites Friedman as the source for this notion of spiritual exercise. He does not then take it from Ignatius of Loyola. He does mention Ignatius, but it's worth noting that in Hadot's text, it is in fact an imaginary interlocutor who mentions Ignatius at this point, asking whether Friedman's idea is simply a repetition of Ignatius's Christian version of spiritual exercises. And Hadot raises this possibility <laughs> simply in order to reject it. So this is my first key point. Hadot takes the idea of spiritual exercises not from Ignatius, but from Friedman, who explicitly defines what he has in mind in opposition to the tradition of Christian spiritual exercises. Now, as an aside, we might also note that there was a further political dimension to Friedman's account too. Reflecting on the challenge of revolutionary political change, he wanted to stress the need not only for political transformation, but also for individual transformation. There's no point trying to change the world if everyone in it remains the same. Um, as Socrates is reported to have said famously, there's no point traveling to different places if all you do is take yourself with you. And Hado explicitly comments on this thought elsewhere as well, suggesting that anyone engaged in political struggle ought also, at a personal level, to engage in a project of self-transformation. So, this is the context in which Hado introduces the notion of spiritual exercise. It is an imaginary interlocutor who raises the objection, perhaps this all sounds a bit too religious, perhaps this all sounds a bit like Ignatius, to which Hadot emphatically responds, no, and adds, in any case, what Ignatius was doing was merely following examples set out by the ancient philosophers. It's not a Christian concept being imposed back on pagan philosophy, but rather a pagan philosophical idea later appropriated. But as we've seen, Hado does not take it from that tradition at all. It comes from a communist socialist who, as it happens, identified as a secular Jew. Okay. So another key point of reference for Hado was the work of Paul Rabo. <clears throat> Friedman had used the phrase spiritual exercise without mentioning Ignatius at all. It was Rabot in his book on soul guidance who drew a link, but also a contrast between ancient philosophical practices and the later Christian practices of Ignatius. Rabot argued that in antiquity, philosophers proposed a whole series of what he called moral or ethical exercises. And these were then subsequently transformed into spiritual exercises um, in the early Christian tradition, which was later then exemplified by Ignatius. In other words, there's a continuity between the practices of ancient philosophy and later Christian spiritual exercises, but there are also some important differences between the two. For Rabot, spiritual exercises belong properly to the religious sphere, in contrast to the purely ethical exercises of ancient pagan philosophy. Now, Hado objects to that account. In his view, the exercises set out in antiquity were never merely ethical. They were always more than that, encompassing a transformation of one's entire being, to use the phrase that Jonathan Barnes found in Compress. So, Hado explicitly rejects the idea that these are merely ethical exercises. And he also preempts the suggestions made by Barnes and Cooper and others more recently um, that we might also, that we might think alternatively simply in terms of intellectual exercises. Neither of those terms he thought do justice to the sort of transformation that the ancient philosophers had in mind. That's why he opted for the phrase spiritual exercises, despite its religious connotations. Although 
it's perhaps worth noting, as my audience in Paris did, that those connotations might be much stronger in English than they are in French, mm. and that in the French context, people have much less of a concern about this, um, and perhaps this is an issue of anglophone reception. In, having said that, though, although himself does know that the term spiritual exercise might be a bit disconcerting, he says, for some modern readers. He explicitly says it's no longer quite fashionable these days to use the word spiritual. Yet ethical or intellectual just won't do, he insists. The practices he has in mind lead to, I quote, a transformation of our vision of the world and to a metamorphosis of our personality. They're not merely about thought or action, but about our entire existence as a living being. Hato also gives a list of previous places where he encountered this phrase before settling on it after reading Friedman. He notes that he first came across it in a book about poetry written way back in the 1940s. Um, and he also encountered it in a number of other French works. So in the 1960s, for instance, uh, Jean-Pierre Vernant used the phrase when discussing Empedocles. So the phrase already had some currency in, um, in France before Hedo started using it. So in the French context then, this was not so unusual a phrase. It had been used already a number of times in non-religious contexts. As Hedo comments in one of his interviews, the expression spiritual exercises does not fool anyone. People, that is philosophers and historians, have used it without thinking of either religion or Saint Ignatius. A little later, he adds, ultimately, I do not think the expression is problematic. Now, in the preface to his study of Goethe, um, he neatly summarized much of this in the following passage. And I'll just say that um, I basically wrote this paper before reading this passage, but it sums up many of the things that I've been talking about, so it fits, fits perfectly. Um, this is what um, Hadot has to say in the, the very recent translation by Michael Chase, this book has just come out. The expression spiritual exercise, which has been used by some historians of thought, such as Louis Gonnet or Jean-Pierre Vanant, or authors such as George Friedman, does not have a religious connotation, whatever some critics may believe. They are acts of the intellect or of the imagination or of the will that are characterized by their goal. By means of them, the individual tries to transform her way of seeing the world in order to transform herself. The point is not to inform, but to form oneself. Which reminds me of the interesting discussion I had with Martha some time ago about motivation, yeah. which I hope we can talk about more recently. However, had I also noted that in some contexts, it might not be the most helpful phrase to use. Consider the contrast between the lived experience of our place in the natural world and a scientific understanding of the same thing. He notes the example of people seeing other planets through a telescope for the first time, um, which is a kind of according to accounts, this is not just the question of gaining scientific inf information, this is a transformative experience. It would be odd, Haddo comments, to call this a spiritual exercise of physics. Instead, he suggests talking in terms of the realization of the presence of the world and our belonging to the world. Another term that Haddo uses often in these contexts and that has drawn criticism is conversion. He describes the sort of transformation that he has in mind as a conversion which turns our entire life upside down changing the life of the person who goes through it. And this also drew some critical comment from Cooper, who questioned the idea that ancient philosophy involved making an existential commitment to a philosophical school. Such a view undermines the fundamental commitment to reason shared by all um, philosophers, Cooper argued. Now the concern here with terms such as conversion or existential choice 
is that they might be taken to imply someone unthinkingly committing to a dogmatic body of thought without much in the way of critical reflection. But Haddo notes that he uses this term in the sense of a change of direction or a transformation. And this need not be unthinking or indeed religious. At one point he comments, all education is conversion. Thus, what Socrates was trying to do when he gave people in dialogue was to convert them to his point of view by means of arguments. Similarly, if someone is converted to, say, Stoicism, that need not mean that they have become an unthinking disciple. On the contrary, it may simply be a way of saying that they've been convinced by the arguments that the Stoics put forward for their views. So, Hado gives an account of why he thinks terms such as spiritual and also conversion are the best to capture what he sees as distinctive features of ancient philosophy. And he argues that they need not be taken as exclusively religious terms. Even so, they do have strong religious connotations for some, perhaps more in English than in French, as I said earlier. And despite Hado's claim for the contrary, they can indeed have been misleading. So should we keep using them? Should we continue to speak of spiritual exercises in the context of ancient pagan philosophy or non-religious philosophy in general, we might say? One way to answer this is to consider the thought the practices that Hado had in mind. His examples um, of ancient spiritual exercises include Socratic dialogue, self-dialogue, inner interrogation, reading, the study of the natural world, reflecting on death, and attending to the present moment. In what sense, if any, are these sorts of practices spiritual? <laughs> and here we come back to etymology. The spiritual is concerned with spirit, spiritus. This has a range of meanings, including breath, life, vital principle, or the non-physical part of a person. Its nearest equivalent in Greek is probably pneuma, which also has the senses of breath and life principle. But one might make a case for aligning spiritus with psuche, which can have a similar range of meanings. And in the case of the Stoics, psuche is itself pneuma in a certain state. For all of the ancient philosophical schools, psuche is that by virtue of which we are alive. It's our essence of living beings. It's more than just our ethical habits or our intellectual abilities. So in this sense, exercises of psuche transform who we are. Now there's one especially relevant ancient text here by the Stoic philosopher Musonius Rufus. Writing in the first century AD, before one could claim any substantive Christian influence, Musonius outlined a distinction between exercises of the body and what he called exercise of the soul, a scarcis testicus. He says that exercises of the soul involve keeping one's philosophical principles ready to hand and training oneself in actually putting them into practice. This distinction is not unique to Musonius, and we find it attributed to the much earlier philosopher, Diogenes the Cynic. Both Musonius and Diogenes use the Greek term psuche here, usually, but perhaps unhelpfully, translated as soul. If spiritual is the appropriate adjective to use for things associated with the soul, then perhaps the phrase spiritual exercise is just fine. Indeed, the most literal way to translate Musonius's phrase, escasis tesupes, would be exercise of the soul. And one might think that spiritual exercise is just a variation on that. However, Addo rejected the formulation of the soul, um, de l'âme, probably because in French, this also has some unhelpful connotations, he thought. However, as many people working on Greek philosophy have commented, soul 
is an imperfect translation of suke for multiple reasons. In Greek thought, suke is that by virtue of which something is alive. Anything alive has suke, including plants. For materialist philosophers like the Stoics and Epicureans, in order to exist, suke must be something physical or material. In the case of the Stoics, suke is physical stuff that flows through the tubes of the nervous system animating the body. Thus, soul, with its connotations of an immaterial and perhaps immortal substance, is far from being helpful as a general translation. Given the distinctions that we've seen Musonius, Diogenes, and also much later Ignatius make, another option might be to translate psuche as mind. As we've seen, both Barnes and Cooper suggested we think of spiritual exercises as simply cases of mental training. So perhaps we ought to think of uh, think in terms of mental exercises for the mind alongside physical exercises for the body. Yet, as the previous points make clear, this too may seem inappropriate in some contexts, for we do not usually think that plants have minds simply in virtue of being alive, which is what having psuche means here. It's difficult then to find a perfect English equivalent for psuche. In another context, Thomas and Barnes suggested animator, drawing on the Latin equivalent anima. Now this nicely captures the that by virtue of which something is alive idea, but unsurprisingly, it's not caught on. <laughs> Unable to come up with a better alternative, most writers on Greek philosophy stick with soul. I suggest that we're in a similar situation with the phrase spiritual exercises. It's in some respects not ideal, because spiritual has the same distracting connotations as soul does. As such, it does have the potential to be misleading or confusing. If we wanted to avoid those connotations altogether, we might replace it with something like mental training. But as we've seen, Hado thinks that undersells what he has in mind. So to take an example, when a philosophy student learns the basics of logic, they undergo a process of mental training learning how to think more clearly. Although this training might have all sorts of real world practical consequences, right? The student can now make better decisions in their lives. It doesn't pretend to transform the student into a different person. That's not what we intend to do in an introduction to logic course. To put it another way, it doesn't try to alter the student's core character. And for Hado, this is the essence of spiritual exercises. They transform who we are. They affect our very being. One might also think of the contrast between meditation undertaken as part of serious Buddhist training aimed at transforming the individual and the sort of mindfulness that is used as an efficiency tool for overstressed executives. While the former is a spiritual exercise in Hado's sense, I take it that the latter surely isn't. But that might be interesting and controversial, so maybe we can talk about that later. So, what's the best way forward here? Spiritual exercises are not spiritual in the way that most people probably understand that term today. It's a phrase that, as Haddo noted, may make some people feel a bit uncomfortable. And if I'm honest, it makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. But I think it's clear Haddo did not take this phrase from Ignatius and anachronistically impose it on ancient pagan philosophy. And so Cooper's criticism is just unfair. On the contrary, Addo took it from Friedman, who explicitly defined it in secular terms. And we might take this phrase as a translation from Musonius's phrase, escarcity per psuches, but only with all the caveats that we always give whenever we translate psuche as soul. One other option, might be to follow Michel Foucault, who, while op openly acknowledging his debt to Hadot's work, did not take up the phrase spiritual exercise. In its place, he talked about practices of the self and techniques of the self. <clears throat> These phrases do have the virtue of sidestepping many of the issues that we've been discussing. And for anyone who feels a bit uncomfortable with the word spiritual, perhaps these are much better alternatives. 
However, Hadot had serious doubts about these phrases, um, describing them as, I quote, yet another example of the impropriety of contemporary philosophical jargon. He also wrote at length about his concerns with the notion of cultivation of the self. Um, and while I and others have argued elsewhere that Hadot may not have been entirely fair to Foucault on this point, there nevertheless remain issues about the use of the term self in this context. So just to give one example, when Socrates is reported to, ex to have exhorted people to take care of themselves, as he famously does, he either uses the reflexive care of oneself, epimelaisthai how to, or he refers to care of the soul, epimelaisthai tesukes. But there is no formulation that refers to a self. In short, then, these Foucauldian phrases have their own different problems. Okay, so. Um, Final bit, folks. I'd like to conclude by taking a slightly different approach to the problem. Um, as we've seen, some commentators in the Anglophone world might feel a little bit uncomfortable with a word like spiritual. And as I've said, I feel a bit uncomfortable with it too sometimes. But perhaps the real issue here is not with the word spiritual, but with that feeling of discomfort. For I suggest that the discomfort is with the thought that ancient Greco-Roman philosophy might have some kind of religious component in it, rather than being a purely rational enterprise. In this context, we might note Martha Nussbaum's famous words of caution against the late work of Michel Foucault, stressing the importance of being able to distinguish clearly between philosophical and religious practices of self-transformation. Let's not get these two things mixed up, folks. That could be a very dangerous path to go down. Nussbaum warns us. We might also note similar concerns raised by Western commentators when confronting Indian and Chinese schools of thought. Are, for example, Buddhism or Taoism philosophies or religions? Are these Western categories even helpful when trying to understand non-European thought? The point I would like to make, and I'm certainly not first to make it, is that the fairly recent post-Enlightenment distinction between philosophy and religion is as problematic when applied to ancient Greco-Roman philosophy as it is when applied to Indian or Chinese thought. The difference, of course, is that in the Greco-Roman tradition, what we are dealing with is unambiguously philosophy in the sense that this term is indigenous to the tradition and is used to self-describe what's being done, right? But it's also shot through from the very beginning with what we would now think of as religious elements. So here's a quick catalogue, folks. Parmenides' poem, the first work of rationalist metaphysics in the Western tradition, and the earliest text we have to offer what we now think of as philosophical arguments, is introduced as a report of a revelation from a goddess. Herodotus reports that the Pythagoreans held strict funerary rituals prohibiting burial in wool, which is something they perhaps inherited from Egyptian religion. Socrates, the grandfather of Western rationalism, outlines his God-given mission inspired by the pronouncements of the Delphic Oracle. He was, he tells us, guided by his daimonium. In particular, he says that even when he had come to a decision about the right, course, the right course of action, he would defer to his inner voice that would sometimes veto his rational decisions. The, and the inner god of Socrates became a topic of whole works by later authors such as Plutarch and Apuleius. There are countless examples in Plato, such as in the Symposium, where Plato has Socrates report the speech of a priestess outlining daimonic forces that exist between the mortal and immortal realms and the role of sacrifice and divination inspired by the Eleusinian mysteries. And interestingly, translators of the symposium often render daimonian in this key passage as spiritual. Or what about the Phaedrus, where Plato has Socrates say that divine madness is the greatest blessing anyone can have? And Aristotle, 
the sober logician and natural scientist urges those in search of the good life to strain every nerve to live a life according to the divine element within them, a life that is almost inhuman. The goal is to become like God, to partake in divine activity. If we, return to, if we turn to materialist and empiricist Stoics, our only extract, extractate from the early Stoics I mentioned earlier is Cleanthes' Hymn to Zeus, addressed to the most glorious of immortals, who is urged to save men from their ignorance and grow up in the wisdom so that they can see the divine reason that animates all things. Even Lucretius, the arch Epicurean rationalist, an enemy of all superstition, dedicates his poem to the goddess Venus before going on to describe the Epicurean goal of emulating the tranquility of the gods. And those are just a few examples that could, of course, be multiplied almost endlessly. For a long time, especially in the Anglophone world, many of these religious elements in Greco-Roman philosophy have been downplayed or silently ignored by some commentators only interested in the arguments that they can extract and convincingly present to their philosophy colleagues. Now, all this is vast and complex in its own right, and I don't want to get too distracted by it here. The point I would like to make is that there is no neat and clean separation between what we would now call philosophy and religion in the Greco-Roman philosophical tradition. Indeed, there isn't much in the subsequent history of Western philosophy either, whether we think of Thomas Aquinas and other scholastic thinkers or Marsilio Ficino's revival of Platonism. Indeed, in one of the first histories of philosophy written in the 17th century by Georg Horn, he opens with a discussion of Hebrew wisdom literature. And his catalogue of the first philosophers start with Adam, Abel, Seth, and so on, followed by Zoroastra and the Chaldeans, long before he gets to Socrates. This is what the history of philosophy looked like in the 17th century. Approaching Greco-Roman philosophy with all of this firmly in mind, it seems odd to get overly concerned about the potentially unhelpful connotations of a word like spiritual. To put it bluntly, the arch rationalist who's intent on saving Greek philosophy from charges of religiosity has much larger problems to contend with than that. Just as such scholars continue to use soul with all the suitable qualifications, there ought to be no problem using spiritual with similar qualifications. But aside from that, I hope to have shown that Hado's use of the term doesn't involve anachronistically imposing a Christian concept back onto pagan Greek philosophy. Thank you. So much of that is a thing of clear and thought provoking talk. We have now, well, 15 minutes for discussion and I will set up together three questions in a row to save time, Elder, then Gianfranco, then Matteo, for now. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. That was very clear and a very informative. Also, many of the aspects I wasn't very aware of, and especially this final reflection about how ancient philosophy and perhaps all the Western philosophical tradition has this religious element. This is very eye-opening, and I think it's very stimulating. I'm very interested in thinking more about this. Uh, and my question uh, concerns what I normally feel as a certain feel or see as a certain ambiguity in. Thank you. Uh, uh, concerns what I normally see as an ambiguity in Ado or a certain fluctuation in the, the way he uses the term spiritual exercise. So the fact that you read right at the beginning, he describes it as transformation of itself. But if you read the passage at the beginning of the essay on spiritual exercise, where he's describing precisely why he rejects lots of the designations, uh, this paragraph ends with the idea that the spiritual exercise it raises to the level of the objective spirit and places the uh, your position is uh, replaced as in a perspective of the whole. So there's, there's, there's these metaphysical cosmic elements 
that sometimes appears in the discussion, that sometimes is more in the background, but it seems to be a very essential aspect of the notion for him. This would uh, allow us to distinguish between other exercises that could be philosophical, but perhaps do not exactly play within this perspective of the whole, and there's certain types of exercises that do that. They also give us a criteria to define what, which philosophical spiritual exercises are the better, so it would be those that can place it better in this perspective of the whole. Uh, I think it's problematic when you don't have a clear metaphysics that could give you a perspective of the whole, so a philosophy who, that, who is more skeptic would perhaps do this in a, would not be able to do this as effectively. In any case, I think it's a very central aspect, and perhaps this could bring so uh, give some meaning to the criticism or at least to the, this idea that there are religious connotations that are perhaps not religious but metaphysical in this sense. Uh, so it, it, it's not simply transformation of the self, but a uh, certain type of transformation of the self that has this very strong metaphysical and cosmic component. Would you agree? Do you think that this has uh, some consequence on the analysis of you? Yeah, no, th thank you very much. Perhaps geometry. No, 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 because no, I'll have forgotten the first vote first. No, I, need to, I didn't want to have a try. Um, but no, th thank, thank you so much. That is a really, really interesting, um, it's a really interesting issue. Um, and I think you're right. I think he often does stress that relationship with the whole. And um, he seems to think that in order to get a in order, in, in, in order for us to get a, a full sort of understanding of ourselves, it needs to be in relation to everything else that's outside us, right? And that can cash out in a number of different ways, depending which ancient philosophy we're talking about, right? And so often Hado has the Neoplatonists in mind. And when he's talking about um, that kind of relationship with the whole or with the one or however we might want to phrase it in the context of, of Neoplatonism, then obviously there's a very, it's not just very metaphysical, but the very specific metaphysical position that's being presupposed. And there are certainly plenty of passages um, with that Neoplatonic view in mind that say all the things that you could understand would provoke Cooper to respond in the way that he does, right? So it's not as if Cooper is doing a terrible misreading of what Hado is saying, because in some places he is saying precisely what Cooper accuses him of doing, right? Um, but of course, there are other places where Cooper, where, where Hado doesn't have the Neoplatonists in mind, and he's talking in more general terms. So if he's talking about Marcus Aurelius in particular, or, or the Stoics more generally, we're talking about a relationship with the whole, but that's a relationship with nature rather than with anything supernatural, you might say. Um, but also, I mean, although he doesn't talk so explicitly about these, you might think in an Epicurean context, you know, um, Epicurean physics is essential for, for understanding Epicurean physics is essential for living a good Epicurean life, right? Because it removes our superstitious fears about, about the world. So that looks like it's an essential component there. Um, and even in the case of skepticism, right? It's the fact that you know that you don't know anything about the whole is something that can relieve many of your anxieties and then, um, um, lead to gen, um, achieving this state of tranquility. So there's a sense in which your relationship with the whole is kind of key, no matter what the ancient philosophical position is, and it need not involve a big metaphysical commitment. Although I agree, in many places where Hado describes it, he often, he does it in those terms. Perhaps because he, you know, understandably, Neoplatonism is perhaps what is most often in the back of his mind. But, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. This um, is uh, um, a topic that uh, uh, has a, a great interest for uh, very interesting for me. And um, well, two two things because uh, um, well. Could we speak uh, precisely, um, taking into account uh, what uh, what you said, that uh, uh, the notion of uh, uh, spiritual also related, for instance, with that of spirituality, uh, 
which is uh, of course more used by uh, by Google in the uh, hermeneutics of the of the subject, uh, can be interpreted as something as of course metaphilosophical, no, in the sense of uh, at all, but also uh, meta religious. Uh, that is, uh, we could speak of a uh, spiritual of a spirituality as uh, as something that uh, cannot be uh, perhaps uh, in modernity, but uh, as you said, also in uh, uh, pre-Socratic antiquity, uh, as uh, not completely philosophical or not completely uh, religious. Um, as, uh, for instance, uh, also Ado and uh, Foucault uh, say and agree um, uh, between them, another concept that of uh, conversion, you know, that, uh, for instance, uh, 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 Ado and Foucault uh, recondite or recover to the, to the conception of uh, epistrophe, of uh, periegen, of uh, metanoia that are present, absolutely present in the philosophical context uh, quite before of uh, religious forms of, uh, of uh, conversion. So in this case, uh, uh, we could uh, also uh, imagine that uh, uh, Cooper's critique to uh, to Ado is uh, uh, also a sort of uh, misunderstanding of uh, what uh, spiritual uh, means in the context uh, throughout uh, the the century. And above all, also uh, we could criticize Cooper also in the case of the imposition of a Saint Ignatius. Uh, 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 reference that is uh, uh, spiritual, of course, takes into account uh, more than the, a simply metaphysical no, question, but also the question of uh, uh, imagination that uh, has a, a role, a very important role that cannot be uh, simply and completely defined uh, or reported to the uh, a logical or argumentative discourse. So, uh, why uh, uh, Foucault and Ado uh, could not speak about spiritual taking in into account precisely this? There's a possibility of to interpret the spiritual or spirituality as uh, uh, notions uh, meta philosophical or meta religious. Um, yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, I'm. Um... I'm just trying to pin down the question in that, but you said lots of interesting things. I'm trying to, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the question was. My question? Mm. Well, yeah, mm, the problem is this, uh, um, about the question you uh, you placed, that, that, that if uh, uh, the, interpre the interpretation of uh, uh, the notion of spiritual, no, uh, of, uh, of a door, uh, is uh, uh, something that could um, uh, could be uh, related, you know, with that, uh, uh, or could be defended by a criticism of a being uh, in uh, our image of religious uh, as uh, as a Cooper as Cooper does. And on the other side, we can see that, and you mentioned you also uh, as it, uh, have shown how, for instance, uh, we have uh, uh, use of the spiritual that is uh, a life that uh, quite before of uh, Ado uses it, can be the case of Vernon and the images, uh, yeah. for instance, well. Uh, so that is uh, uh, the question for me. It's a sort of a meta meta philosophical question. You know, if uh, uh, beginning uh, with uh, uh, this answer that we can uh, uh, give to Cooper, you know, uh, if we cannot uh, simply um, understand the approach, uh, the notion of uh, spiritual in a different sense, precisely getting uh, uh, into account uh, the use and the renovation of the use of that the other ways. Yeah. I'm, the okay. So, I mean, I'm, so this is what I was trying to, to outline, right? So, I mean, the concern with the word spiritual for, for, for me and perhaps others is what does it refer to, right? Um, I mean, does it refer to some kind of immaterial spirit? Um, does it refer to the the soul, um, 
you know, and in English, these are problematic words. What precisely do they mean? So how do we kind of pin that down a bit? So, so this is really what I was trying to do. If we can pin, if we can, if we can see the spiritual being connected with 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 suke, with soul in the Greek sense of the of the word, then that perhaps gives us just something to kind of grip onto, right? That could then give us a foundation for thinking how we might use the English word spiritual um, in a non-religious context. So yeah, it's really just trying to pin, pin down, pin, you know, pin down the, the meaning of the word, which either just has very religious connotations or is just very vague and we don't know really what it means at all. Thank you. Hear me? All right. Thank you, John, for your presentation. Um, my question is fairly simple and direct. Actually, so if the essence of the notion of spiritual exercises is indeed that these exercises promote a transformation of their recognition, I was wondering, couldn't we simply replace the notion of uh, spirituality in spiritual exercises with that of the transformative or the transformation? I mean, it would be be losing any meaning in using the notion of transformationality instead of spirituality? Yeah, no, that's... Maybe I can that's... just add something because I had a related question. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the idea of transformation is actually already implied in the notion of exercise somehow. And spiritual should qualify the kind of transformation that is at stake. And probably that's what is more problematic. I think you're... I'm convinced by your argument that we don't need uh, to be to so carefully distinguish between philosophy and religion in, in, ancient, in the ancient world. Uh, but uh, my main problem, perhaps, with the idea of spiritual exercises as describing what we do when we philosophize is that it seems that, we, that philosophy loses specificity, right? Because religion also makes, also operates the spiritual transformation, right? And other practices you can add, you can think of psychotherapy today, self help, coaching, mindfulness. And what is the specificity of philosophy? What kind of transformation is specific to philosophy if everything is spirituality? Thank you. Thank, yeah, thank you both. Um, and, and, and that effectively is Martha Nussbaum's concern. Yeah. Uh, uh, when she comments on, on Foucault's work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, transformative looks like it, it, it could be helpful, but as you said, maybe that's implicit in, in exercise already. Um, I quite like the use, I, I quite like the word existential, but I'm not going to suggest that we use that because that has all sorts of other unhelpful connotations, but existential with a small e seems like it kind of captures what we're talking about here, right? An ex, you know, a transformation of, of who you are seems to be what he wants to wants to use. And again, in a French context, you can imagine precisely why Hadot wouldn't use that because um, because it has those connotations, right? So yeah, it, it it's tricky to know precisely. I mean, in the part in something I wrote previously uh, at one point, I think I just used the phrase philosophical exercises, yeah, and, and then you kind of. Okay, and then you have to specify precisely what that does. Well, hopefully that has the right connotations that would allay the concerns of someone like Nussbaum or, or, or Marta, right? That this is based on, on you know, careful arguments and use of reason, but the ex and then the exercise word in the case that there's a trans transformation that goes goes along with it. So yeah, but we are just now sort of worrying about a phrase and I mean if everyone in the room can agree that spiritual isn't too problematic then we can just continue and move on right <laughs> but then when you take it to a wider audience then then there's that concern that people might get misled or, or um, distracted. We know that there are still questions in the audience and but we are already running out of time and I didn't want to, to take the opportunity of the public at home to say something if they wish so if somebody online has a question I don't know where you are. In the spirit of the If somebody wants to materialize a question. It's also, uh, yeah, you're blocked there. No, it's just. Yeah, apparently no one is uh, okay, raising their hand or making okay. anything. Okay. Yeah. So, Leonard? Okay. Good. And then. Oh. 
So this is the third version of this paper. Now I'm going to kind of uh, push you to the fourth. Version. <laughs> I, I, the reason I want to do that is because I think this this version doesn't. It's like it's kind of in parts a little bit, and I'm think I think there are some tensions between the main part and the conclusion. Uh, the main part uh, shows a kind of modern unease with religion. We don't want to go there. You know, the concern we don't want to contaminate philosophy with any of that religion stuff, you know, supernatural, super sketchy, you know, you know, right? But the last part of the paper suggests that this distinction is very problematic. And indeed, if it's problematic, that's very useful because it suggests that we can look more without as much unease at these religious traditions and are not just in the ancient world and not just in China or India, but even our own religious traditions as, as perhaps a narrative way of doing philosophy, a narrative plus ritual way of doing philosophy, etc. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so I understand completely what you mean. And I'm sure there is a fourth version anyway um, in the pipeline. I mean, what I'll say is this. So you're right. The first half of the paper is predicated on that unease. But I think that unease is coming from the critics. So rather than from me, I said that I had no idea what the word spiritual means, right? Not I'm worried about the word spiritual because it has unhelpful religious connotations. My concern was I just don't know what this word's referring to. It's, 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 it's imprecise, it's vague. I, I, I don't know what the reference is. So that was, that was the, the concern that I had. And then I was trying to pin that, pin that down. Um, but yes, I'm sure it can be interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much. We need to close this uh, talk. Uh, thank you for John again. Thank you for